Good evening uh, or good morning from wherever uh, you're joining. It's absolutely a pleasure to have uh, all of you back again for this very interesting Thinkers uh, Dialogue. Uh, we have a very special guest today. Uh, in fact, we have uh, Dr. S.Y. Qureshi. In fact, uh, he's one person who needs no introduction. Uh, but then I think I, I should really share a couple of things about him which fascinate me. Uh, and uh, one, uh, one very interesting thing is that we share a date of birth. Uh, so he's born on June 11th. So uh, uh, have a happy birthday to you, sir. Like within the next two days, you're going to have your birthday. So uh, the only difference is that we were born about 26 years apart. Uh, but that's the only difference. But we share the date of uh, birth. Uh, and then, of course, uh, Dr. Qureshi was part of the Indian Administrative Service. He's an IS officer from the 1971 uh, batch. And then the most he held one of the most important posts in the country, uh, which is a constitutional uh, post like uh, the 17th Election Commissioner of India. Uh, and of course, uh, it is one big uh, task to actually be an election commissioner for a country like India because of the size of the democracy and so on and so forth. Uh, other than that, uh, he is uh, a BA in um, master's in, uh, he's a BA honors, master's in history from Stephens College. He's done his PhD from Jamia uh, in the area of social work. Uh, and then of course he has uh, impeccable language skills. In fact, I was, uh, I'm sure he knows Hindi, English, of course, then he is an expert in German, Persian, and Arabic. Uh, so that's something very fascinating. Uh, and then, of course, uh, to say the least, uh, he has been a torchbearer of democracy across the world uh, with the kind of work that he has done with various organizations. He sits on the board of advisors of International Institute of Democracy and Electoral Assistance in Stockholm. He's worked with uh, Kofi Annan, uh, on democratic uh, issues, and he's actually he was also the member of Global Commission on Elections, Democracy, and Security, uh, and he's been nominated as Global Ambassador of uh, Democracy. Uh, so one of the foremost torchbearers of democracy in the world, uh, and last but not the least, he's actually been on the Indian Express list of 100 most powerful Indians. Uh, so in fact, he is somebody who is who can be actually uh, given credit for some amazing sets of uh, reforms within the election commission in India. And that's where it is. Uh, Dr. Qureshi, it is just an honor to have you with us uh, today. Thanks a lot for joining it. Uh, and then of course, I, I must not uh, miss telling you that he's written one of the most interesting books that I've actually read in the last uh, one year. Uh, and it is The Population Myth. Uh, I would recommend, uh, published by HarperCollins, I would really suggest that all of you should really read this book for the insights that it actually uh, provides. Uh, but without further ado, we'll just quickly jump into the conversation. Uh, so, Dr. Qureshi, uh, uh, we will start with your book, and I'm sure as we go into the conversation, there would be many, many things that I'll, uh, many more questions that will emerge. Uh, but, you know, like the biggest thing uh, that we, we in India are really going through, uh, and there is this myth that uh, uh, there, there is going to be an overtaking of the Muslim population in India, and that's a fear. Uh, in fact, there is no way from the numbers that we can actually get to that position. Even if you go for an exponential growth, it is not going to happen. Uh, and so, why do you, what is really happening? Like, what is this myth of takeover? You know, the, this has been a propaganda of the right wing for the 30, 40 years. And uh, it has become louder uh, recently that uh, very soon Muslims uh, will take over and they will uh, in, the, in their numbers and then capture political power. And they, many of them have made appeal to Hindus to produce more children, produce 10 children, otherwise the Muslims will ca catch up and will overtake. So, and there are so lots of uh, such statements have recorded in my book. Uh, the whole purpose was, is to basically scare the Hindus into hating the Muslims. And in fact, actually, the, the right wing the, who is working on it has succeeded. Yeah, and uh, they're getting uh, reaping uh, political dividends also, electoral dividends. They've been winning elections or only on polarization. Because 80%, 90% of the people are basically well-meaning, good uh, and uh, loving people. But uh, yeah, that has been converted into hate by this propaganda, which I have tried to break and uh, you know, in various possible ways. There are five myths which um, I have summed up. And uh, if you will, if you like, I can just uh, mention to you those five myths. Number one myth is that the Muslims are uh, producing so many children that they are responsible for population explosion. 
Second myth is that it is disturbing the demographic balance. Third is that it is an organized conspiracy to overtake Hindus. Fourth is that they use polygamy to increase their population. The fifth myth is more common among the Muslims, but also among the other that Islam is against family planning. Now, if I were to tell you the reality of those five myths, one, that Muslims produce too many children, it is true that they have birth rate is the highest, right? But the second highest birth rate is of the Hindus. Also, the, the impression that, that was created, which was even, even a, uh, which penetrated my mind also before I started working on this paper 25 years ago, that uh, suppose a Hindu family has two children, Muslim family has 10 children, eight children. So that is a common perception, very widespread. But the fact is, as I've shown in the book, the difference between Hindu and Muslim and the size of the family was never more than one child. 1.1 to be exact, which too for the last 30 years has been going down and the gap has now narrowed down to 0.48, half the child. So to, on that basis to say that look, Muslims are uh, producing like pigs, but um, uh, all the others are fine. Uh, number, uh, uh, number two in the queue are the Hindus. So that is something that people need to understand. Now, whether it is disturbing the demographic balance, to a certain extent, they are right. Uh, because uh, in 1951, 84% of the population was Hindu, which by 2011 census had come down to 79.8. That is a reduction of 4.2. Now, this reduction uh, was distributed over uh, all other communities, mainly the Muslim, whose number went up from 9.8 to 14.2. Now, to that extent, uh, this um, uh, uh, allegation is conceded, is accepted. The, yes, the demographic balance has been determined. But if you see in absolute numbers, in the, the 1951, there were 30 crore more Hindus than Muslims. Today, there are 80 crore more Hindus than Muslims. So where is the balance getting disturbed? Actually, the balance is getting disturbed the other way. So the gap is widening. And finally, to clinch this argument, I got my friend, um, the Professor Dinesh Singh, who was Vice Chancellor of Delhi University, who is a great mathematician. I sent him all my data, and um, my data means Government of India data, NFHS, National Family Health Survey data. And I said, look, if this is the trend, how soon can Muslims take over? So he said, forget about it, Bhajan, not in six years, not in 60 years, not in 600 years, never. Never, and he has given a mathematical model which I have published uh, in the book. Now, third uh, allegation was that it is an organized conspiracy to overtake the Hindu. I have not come across any mullah saying, hey, you know, you should produce uh, too many children so that you can take over and become a majority. Of course, we have come across many mullahs saying that uh, Islam is against family planning, the myth which I mentioned, the fifth myth. Uh, therefore, uh, Muslims should not practice family planning, but that is because they believe that Islam is against it, which is a myth I have broken separately. Now, the fourth thing, which is the most interesting, that uh, that Muslims use polygamy to produce more children. Now, within this myth, there are four myths. One, that polygamy in India is just not possible. Why, why, why do I say that? Because uh, it depends on the gender ratio. Gender ratio uh, uh, is adverse against women, unfortunately, for the last 100 years, which is a separate sad story. Now, what does it mean, gender ratio? How many women are there for 1,000 men? The, uh, last year, there were only 924 women for 1,000 men. So if I want to go out to marry a second woman, the second woman is just not available. Because every single man, every man does not have a wife. Because many of them are without wives because their number is smaller. In fact, statistically speaking, it may sound like a joke, but statistically it makes a sound statement that you and I also do not have one full wife. Statistically, we all have 0.9 wives. Now, it is not a joke, but that is what it is. So in such a situation, where is polygamy possible? And hum paanch, humare pachche, some top leaders have said, hum paanch, humare pachche, some char, humare as if every, every Muslim has four wives and 20 children or 40 children. 
it's it, they can't be a bigger lie than that now whether this uh, lie is being uh, uh, the mouth the time and again deliberately or out of ignorance i would not believe that it is out of ignorance because the right wing people are very highly educated people and they have the you know their research cells and uh, they they are knowledgeable so the second option is that they are doing it deliberately to create mischief and to create hatred among the hindus for the muslims and you know create a feeling of insecurity now the third myth uh, within polygamy that uh, that is among the muslim that muslims also believe that islam encourages uh, polygamy which is not true which is what have pointed out there is only one verse in the whole quran which talks of polygamy and which says that you can marry two three or four uh, but it is conditional that you should treat them equally it doesn't mean that you bring a, a woman and uh, treat her like a servant or a sex slave no you have to treat her equally now more important than that the context this verse is there in the context of the orphans and widows then there used to be lots of orphans and widows because of the tribal warfare in tribal warfare the men would die and the widows and the children would be left behind so god is telling us that treat the orphans fairly justly do not um, take away their property do not cheat them do not replace their good things with your bad thing but and ideally from among the orphans you should can marry two or three or four from among the orphans now even the mullah who uh, uh, said that islam allows family planning but conditionally i say uh, there is not just one condition of equality actually there are two condition the first condition is from among the orphans marry two or three or four um so that they get economic security that was the purpose so now this is the, the condition i've never come across anywhere in any book um uh, not heard anybody say that but i okay, my interpretation from the quran directly is that very clearly this was, was in the context of uh, the orphan now if i want to marry a second woman yeah i, I will uh, i'll be looking for a virgin now what what is that that was not the purpose of this verse of the quran so that is something which even muslim we need to understand finally you know there is has been only one study of polygamy in the country uh, which found that all communities in india have some extent of polygamy and the least polygamous are the muslims now we so the tribals were 15% plus buddhist jains then hindus 5.8% and muslims 5.7% so i you know my community is not uh, polygamous but i'm willing to fight and die for this right now if polygamy is banned uh, since i'm not even practicing this why should i object to it let, let, let it be banned so as is as it is in 22 muslim country so why should they even muslim be protesting it but then the uh, paradox is that those who do not practice polygamy actually they are fighting for it and those who are attacking muslims they are the ones who are doing it even more so this is something which uh, all this is a matter of data now somebody might say look uh, you are talking of one study in 70 years what can i do there is has been only one study and in any case i have then corroborated it with census data of 1931 41 and 51 and found exactly the same trend that all is the same same proportion of different communities in polygamy and the least of all were the muslim in all these senses and finally islam is against family planning so that is also is a myth which i have broken nowhere in the quran islam quran has allah has prohibited uh, family planning and uh, there is a verse in the quran where allah says that whatever we wanted to prohibit for you we have explained to you in detail that doesn't mean allah suffers from loss of memory the whatever he wanted to uh, wanted you to uh, give up he has already told you like liquor like um, uh, promise for sex and various things so he said there is an ayat which says that whatever we wanted to prohibit for you we have prohibited in detail we have explained in detail so but there is no prohibition of uh, family planning anywhere in the quran in fact interestingly uh, i have some you know there are only interpretations there are some in favor 
of family planning, some against family planning. But my own interpretation that there is one way, verse in the Quran which is clinching to me, and it says that, oh young men, to keep yourself from promiscuity, you must marry when you have the means. Now, one young man went to the Prophet and said that um, uh, I am a poor man, but I have my sexual desire, my sexual need. What should I do? So, Prophet repeated that verse and he said, Till you have the means to bring up a family, you should resort to fasting because fasting suppresses sexual desires. So, together, the words of the Quran and uh, uh, instruction of the Prophet, together are a recipe for family plan. Finally, one more hadith on which I will end. That the one uh, hadith is what Prophet said and what he used to do. So, so uh, it is reported that somebody went to the Prophet and he said, I have many children and I don't want any more. And I want to practice withdrawal method, which is in Arabic called Al-Azl. But uh, Jews say that that is minor infanticide. On which the Prophet replied, no, no, the Jew is wrong, the Jew is wrong. Which means that if you practice withdrawal method to stop many, any more children, you are right, absolutely fine. So even the method is approved. So what more proof do we want that Islam is not against family planning? In fact, interestingly, uh, the, um, far from being uh, opposed to family planning, we find that 1400 years ago, when there was no population pressure anywhere in the world, anywhere in the world, Islam is talking of uh, uh, right upbringing, quality of life, uh, uh, a small family, as I, as I mentioned in the uh, prescription that you wait till you are able to uh, marry and raise a family. So now these are some uh, lots of myths which need to be uh, explained, which I have done, tried to do through my book. Sorry for the longish answer, but uh, my future answers will be shorter. No, no, I think this is this is so fascinating in terms of setting the context. You know, like, uh, and driving from what you have actually said, there are many issues that actually emerge. In fact, uh, you've also mentioned in your book, and it's a very powerful uh, statement, it says, there is no clash of civilizations that is happening in India. Indian Muslims are part of Indian culture. I think this is a very beautiful statement that you've given in your uh, book. I just want you to say a few things because, you know, like this sets it right. Uh, this sets it right in many ways that we are all together. We are just part of the same, uh, what do you call, flavor of the world or uh, the way we live. Yeah, correct. You know, the, after all, uh, Muslims have been there for uh, over uh, 1,000 years. So 1,000 years is a long time for interaction. They settled down, they married here. Most of the Muslims in India are actually converts. So uh, mostly from the lower caste and the tribals and others. So uh, obviously when they converted, they brought in their uh, traditional practices with them. So if you go to a Muslim home, or in the Hindu home in uh, North India, you will find hardly any difference. In fact, I would feel uh, less difference between a North Indian Hindu than a South Indian Muslim family. Their style is different because they, they are regional factor. Culture is more regional. Uh, and uh, uh, therefore, uh, to say that there is a Muslim rate of growth and a Hindu rate of growth, and uh, I can explain to you statistically also, there is no such thing. There is so much of diversity. You know, for instance, in Bihar, if uh, uh, Muslims have uh, four children, in Tamil Nadu, the 1.7 children. So, and uh, in all the other states uh, in between, there are 22 states where the birth rate of uh, Muslims is lower than in the Hindus of Bihar. If religion was a factor, so everywhere a Muslim would be producing four children uh, like in Bihar. Now in Bihar, both Hindus and Muslims are backward. Therefore, both are producing more children. Hindus are producing 3.11 children as against the Muslim 4.1 or 2. So one of the, you know, like on your point, uh, one of the biggest things that comes across or as a narrative, uh, right or wrong, and I would like you to answer this, that, oh, there has been such a huge demographic catastrophe in places like Kerala, Jammu and Kashmir and Bengal or West Bengal. Uh, and that is one of the biggest narratives that has actually been happening right now. Uh, how, do you, how would you want to react to this? Say, what do you mean by the uh, catastrophe? 
Uh, when I say catastrophe, like that is what the right, what you call as a right wing propaganda or whatever, that there is a whole huge demographic uh, thing that has happened, that the whole demographic yeah. influence has actually gone out of control. Uh, there is a complete takeover by the community or whatever. Uh, no, no. To, to say that uh, this has happened recently, actually, in uh, Kashmir, in the, in the valley, Muslims have been in majority from day one. Yeah. And, uh, and they have not uh, produced so many children to, you know, uh, to uh, upset the balance even more. The same uh, ratio uh, which was there 60 years or 50 years ago has continued. In Kerala, there are about 30%. And there are a similar percentage of Christians there. So now wherever there are more Muslims, you know, that is when this uh, mischief is created more. You know, because you can... Otherwise, um, uh, in a uh, state where uh, Muslims are so few that even if you make this propaganda, it will make no sense to the Hindus because the Hindus and their children have not seen a Muslim for years. So uh, it will... They will not even make any sense. Now, wherever Muslims are in large numbers, like in Kerala or in Bengal or Assam, that is where this noise is made deliberately because it's easier to create, a, you know, that insecurity uh, among the Hindus uh, in the, those areas. Um, now, you can't do, do that in uh, Orissa, for instance, because there are only 4% Muslim. So, who, which uh, Hindu will feel threatened? But this propaganda is, a, is of a kind which will even frighten the 95% people in, uh, into fear that, you know, these 4% are uh, going to overtake you. You know, the, there is an absurdity there which needs to be called out, which is what I have attempted to do. Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Qureshi, you know, like, what, what you call as absurdity, and I fully agree with you on that. Uh, the biggest thing that happens is that how are we able to perpetuate this myth? And you, you also mention it in your book that this myth has become a fulcrum of dangerous communal polarization. What drives this? Like, why is it that people are falling into this trap? Because, of course, it's a trap. If you want to say it is a trap or is it a, a right, wrong, but how do we really get into this kind of a conversation or for this kind of narrative? Yeah, you know, one is that if you tell a lie again and again and again, people start believing it. So this has been repeated so often. That even I, I must say that even I fell uh, victim to this. Even I thought when I started writing this paper uh, that, uh, yeah, yes, Muslims have every Muslim family had 10 children, many wives and all that, which turned out to be all rubbish, right? So the uh, propaganda that surely was and propaganda has a purpose. And since 2002 Gujarat election, uh, it has uh, been shown that polarization is the only way to win elections. And uh, so far it has been working. And only in West Bengal, uh, uh, this trend did not continue, which has raised hope because now people have started realizing. Also, you know, the, interestingly, when I was writing my book uh, and when I published it, I was uh, apprehensive that it, there would be a uh, lot of right-wing backlash. But there is none, zero. Why? Because, uh, in fact, uh, if at all, there is a lot of positive feedback. Those who have read the book um, uh, find that uh, everything is based on statistics of government of India. Nothing, there is no emotional undertone. There is no political undertone. It's just facts and figures explained uh, uh, contextually uh, in the right perspective. So, uh, I think there are people who are responding to this I don't know, you read the book, uh, Amit, you tell me, uh, what was your reaction? Were there not surprises for you in this book? Uh, sir, I work in the same area, so, uh, uh, you know, like, but I, I, I could get the information, but the, the most surprising element, and uh, one thing was your mathematical model and how beautifully it has actually been built, and the most positive as well. I'll not say surprising, I'll say very positive. Uh, and I would, my next question was emerging from there as, as well, and that, could you just share something on this mathematical model? Because this dispels a lot of myths uh, that we actually have. Because I think according to this model, uh, there is just no way that we can actually get to a figure that you're really, uh, anybody is talking about. In 2021, as I see, uh, what it says is that Muslims will be 21.34 crore and Hindus would be close to about 116 crore. Yeah. So that means like the, the difference is actually rising over a period of time. And I think this this has to be really shared 
uh, yeah is, because this, this could be yeah. the information which is the uh, information for all of us no when you say difference is rising please clarify what difference not difference of a muslim is increasing it is the difference that hindus are increasing haldi haldi people accepted well accepted you and i'm just going back to your point that the the difference is from 30 crores to 80 crore and it is actually going yeah. to be now far bigger it is going to be close to 90 crores yeah 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 same same trend will continue and which is the, the purpose of the mathematical model and it has been done by by uh, uh, a very eminent uh, professor who is a rajput who is not a muslim and not my cousin and and of course like in in terms of like one positive or one surprise and which which i must ask you you know like Uh, when i was reading your book it, it does come across very very powerfully in the book that the prophet uh, was one of the biggest reformers that the world has actually seen uh, and he created a religion at that point in time or which became a religion over a period of time uh, which was to be a very with a very huge reformist agenda uh, but then what do you think has happened in the world that this whole uh, idea seems to have or the reformist view seems to have actually taken a back seat in the minds of the people in the world because i'm not talking about india here really. i'm talking across the world there seems to be a huge shift in the world what do you think is driving that because uh, you know it's very unfortunate uh, because even uh, we wonder that there are 50 plus muslim countries and uh, uh, they have not produced uh, much of science and medicine how many nobel laureates have come from the muslim countries uh, very very few although it is the same community the same religion which in the early 4 or 5 centuries produced uh, algebra arithmetic uh, you know uh, architecture art uh, science so muslims were dominating all these fields uh, in the early centuries what has happened to uh, to them and why they have declined that is something uh, which surely muslims should uh, introspect and uh, and try and improve the uh, in fact i am uh, have been thinking of writing an article uh, the title of which is islam versus the muslims you know the fact is that islam said something and muslims are doing something different now for instance the islam is a religion which has the maximum possible emphasis on education the very first word which was revealed on the prophet was iqra read recite o prophet that is how began and he was a uh, mind you unlettered now read o prophet that is how uh, quran begins and uh, then the uh, quran and uh, hadith both of them emphasize education uh, as a duty for both muslim then uh, for boys and girls men and women but why is it that muslim women all over the world have the least literacy now uh, that which is why i say islam versus the muslim now the uh, if you were would seen uh, you would have seen from my book the right of uh, rights of women in islam 1400 years ago they even had right to property which uh, was has been given by the modern uh, country the only in the last 60 or 70 and 100 years but islam gave it 1400 years through the verses of the quran property right the right for equality they used to do business they used to fight equally shoulder to shoulder in wars so uh, what happened to that equality now again that is a contradiction uh, islam versus the muslim so and uh, unfortunately you know there is a whole western uh, uh, situation where it suits politically to target uh, islam and vilify islam and create islamophobia do you, you know interestingly in 1992 when i first became joint secretary of government of india there was a meeting of uh, by the uh, organized by ib intelligence bureau for the joint new joint secretary is about the security situation how to secure your offices your home and there was a section on international security somebody said that now that soviet union has broken down um america will have to manufacture an enemy to keep their whole nation united and that uh, manufactured enemy will be most probably islam so they have created islam so that they create islamophobia again you know muslims are coming earlier it used to be oh communists are coming they get united um, uh, we want now it says uh, muslims are coming so the fact that 
politically uh, uh, it's a historical evolution politically it happened that islamophobia became a uh, political expediency so uh, and exactly the same situation and same expediency exists in india so it suits uh, the politics of the day globally and which is why you know jihad jihad now actually the word jihad also is a totally distorted misunderstood jihad was your own uh, will power and strength to suppress your sexual desires for instance to sup- uh, to fight against illiteracy to fight against greed to uh, basically the against your evils within you is uh, that is uh, was the purpose of jihad was now uh, now islam and jihad islam and jihad whereas islam meant peace and uh, the peace has uh, taken a back seat it is the jihad which has become the center of uh, all the narrative so that uh, sad situation so but then just just going back to uh, history uh, out here a little bit yeah, again beyond the book if, if you have the answer or if you have a view on this do you, do you think it was the shift in iran in the 1980s which probably caused this or which was a driver for this because until that time i don't see any evidence that there was a whole huge idea of islamophobia or people were so anti or uh, whatever no no i think uh, it was uh, the result of the breakdown of the soviet union now you will remember in 1979 when russia invaded afghanistan to for me that is a milestone because when they invaded uh, afghanistan now how to throw the russians out that is when general diaola uh, of pakistan and america got together and they said let us uh, now in islam islam every muslim knows that uh communism is uh, against any religion they say the religion is the opium of the people now uh, they, that was the thing which was emphasized to these uh, mullahs they created a whole uh, uh, section of the mullahs uh, and gave them arm training and converted into jihad that throwing these uh, heretic uh, and non believer kafir uh, communist out of the country is your religious duty now once uh, the, and the, sure enough these guys uh, throughout the the communist and that uh, started the break up of the soviet union now once the soviet union was gone so the the enemy which had to be the created and manufactured which was islam so now say the same mullahs who are now left jobless trained and armed but jobless so they then t- turned the eyes on america they became anti america Hey, look we have been exploited we have been used abused and left in the lurch so they took the guns on the americans and that is where this uh, islamophobia uh, started is uh, it has its origin not so much in uh, iran it, it was a specific to iran for, for sure by what you say but uh, globally it has started from afghanistan okay a very interesting part of history you know, like some something that happened at that point in time has had huge repercussions and we continue to uh, see that uh, but you also alluded to a very important point and that was there is a certain backwardness in the community uh, and of course there is clear evidence in fact uh, from your previous uh, answer as well you did say that the education levels have actually been lower and things like what has driven this like why is it uh, it has gone to that kind of a situation specifically say in india where do you think we must have actually gone wrong as a government or whatever and across the board like we are talking about the last 70 years here yeah it's a, it's a very good question and that's a question we muslims also should ask why is it that uh, we have uh, fallen back one could be you know because after the partition the educated class migrated to pakistan and it's only the uh, you know the worker class uh, and uh, uneducated people who were left behind so that has now increased so that is one secondly i think in the poverty of the muslims has something to do with it because uh, many uh, parents could not afford uh, to send their children to school so there are instances galore when children were withdrawn from a school to uh, supplement their family income so which continued and but we need to break that uh, chain and that process and reverse it uh, as soon as possible which is what i have tried to say in the book that uh, whatever may be the right way propaganda uh, for hindus to produce 10 children 
Muslim should accept family planning uh, proactively in a very uh, in a, in a big way and keep the families small and focus on their education. Because you know something which I have mentioned in the book that Islam uh, was not a factor, conspiracy was not a factor. There are actually three factors: socio-economic factor. One is literacy. As the literacy goes up, the, the number of children goes down across the board, across all communities. <laughs> Similarly, as the income goes up, the number of children goes down and service delivery when it improves the uh, number of children. Now, these are the three factors we should focus on. Now, here you would notice the right wing, which talks of, uh, you know, Muslim that uh, 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 the culprit, they produce too many children. Now, uh, if we tell them that these are the three factors, if you want the Muslim to keep the family this small, focus on their education, have you ever heard of the heard them talk of Muslim education? If at all, even a little bit of education, which is a part through madrasa, the, the way madrasas are vilified, madrasa is just an Arabic word for a partshala. Now, if we tomorrow from tomorrow we, we start calling madrasa the Urdu partshala, will that be fine? So you know, secondly. They, instead of uh, increasing their uh, income, which will uh, bring down the, their number of children, if you really want them to practice family planning, increase their income. What do we hear? Don't do business with them. Do their economic boycott. Don't buy vegetables from a Muslim uh, uh, vegetable seller. So this is what you hear. What would you call this propaganda? Ill-informed or mischievous or whatever, or both. But service, thirdly, service delivery. Service delivery also is the least in the Muslim areas because as it is, Muslim uh, ghettoization has been on the increase. Uh, every time there is some communal disturbance, Muslims move out to safer areas where there are, they are in larger number. Now, these uh, clusters are described as routinely described by common people as mini Pakistan. Now, if you want to post a doctor, he would not go there. Now, without a doctor or without a nurse, how will uh, somebody uh, undergo sterilization? So, uh, therefore, the, uh, we have uh, found that service delivery among the Muslims is the least uh, because nobody wants to go to these mini Pakistan. Uh, now, we, we need to break that cycle also if you want uh, the area to develop. So, and in spite of all these challenges, uh, my appeal to Muslim community through this book is to accept uh, family planning. In fact, interestingly, the Amit Ji, uh, uh, you, uh, you would have noticed that I have, ultimately I said it's not a Hindu versus Muslim question at all. Hindus and Muslims are on the same end of the spectrum. If Muslims have the highest birth rate, who has the second highest? Hindus, uh, which is much worse than all other communities. So the, which means they are on one side of the spectrum. So because the socioeconomic factor which I mentioned, those indicators are more or less similar. Hindus are, are a little bit better in those indicators. So therefore, they're a little bit better in uh, fertility rate. So uh, these factors uh, are common to both these communities. And we have to uh, work for both communities to uh, adopt family planning, keep the family small, and uh, bring them up, give them education. And uh, education will lead to their uh, income also. You know, they, it will uh, make them uh, uh, eligible to, for job, uh, for skills. So we have to focus on their education and skills. So when you say three things, education and increasing uh, income, uh, that is, uh, and the third is service delivery. These are very important steps. Uh, what do you think can be done on immediate basis to really kickstart this process? Because that, that is where it becomes a policy issue as well. Right? Because it becomes very important to you from your point of view. And I think I would accept that because there is nothing uh, outlandish as to what you're suggesting. These are very basic things that we are really talking about. How do we really kickstart this process? And the second part of this question is, can we not really do this without bringing religion into the picture at all? Why? Because in your point, when you say, Muslims should be done this or whatever. I'm just wondering, like, can't we just eliminate the idea of religion uh, yeah. per se? Right. No, no, obviously, they, once we have identified the causes and they have been identified by several studies. So obviously, we have to improve our education policy. It's not just that the Muslim 
uh, are the least educated. Uh, their enrollment ratio is the lowest. But the second lowest is of the Hindus also, which is a matter of concern. So, well, uh, you know, our education policy should make sure that everybody, every child goes to school and complete the process of his schooling, at least his schooling. And after that, uh, uh, migrate to the vocational training. So uh, that is something uh, which has been a failure of our education policy. You know, I've mentioned in the book that um, uh, our workforce uh, percentage is only 4.7 or so. And with 4.7 skilled workers, we are dominating the world. How many of the scientists and uh, IT professionals in America uh, are Indians? They form only far less than 5%. And this same percentage of uh, skilled workers in South Korea is 96%. Imagine 5%, China it is 24%. And UK, USA, other are all in between. Now, if I have said that if 5% becomes even 10%, we will uh, take over the world. Because uh, as it is, you know, because people of India, they proved they are basically bright and given the skills, they are dominating uh, the service sector worldwide. And they are only 5%. So if our 1% is employed, 9% are not only unemployed, they are unemployable because of the poor quality of education. So which is not a Hindu-Muslim phenomenon, that's a national phenomenon. And we need to invest in education and health, uh, which has been uh, the, uh, the cry of uh, all the social sector people. That this, this is where the government of India should make uh, maximum investment. Whereas, how much percent of GDP are we spending on uh, these two? And every year the budget is slashed. So, uh, surely uh, it is uh, the, the government which has to uh, take the first step. However, for the community, I have also appealed to the community because we can only pray to the, the government, but we can appeal to the, our own community to uh, take up education, which is a religious duty. To the in right earnest and improve the quality of, uh, of uh, the citizens. So I think uh, there has been an improvement. Actually, ever since the uh, demolition of Babri Masjid, there was a rethink among the Muslims, then uh, a lot of focus has been on education. And uh, uh, there has been a lot of improvement, but a lot more needs to be done. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Kureshi, you, you yourself alluded to a very important uh, point. And that was that, you, you know, like the number of wives which are actually available per person is 0. 0.9 and then of course 924 women per thousand. Uh, and of course, uh, polygamy is just not possible by the sheer number itself. How do we really blunt this very idea and that, we, that there is this whole polygamous thing because it becomes very easy uh, if yeah. we are able to blunt that idea because that becomes a very important peg uh, on this yeah. pillar. Uh, and, and then... When you talk about, say, uniform civil code, which is really talking about just having a similar thing, uh, why why such a furore that actually happens on this? Because the numbers are exactly uh, in favor of what you're saying. Yeah. Now, I have already proved to you, I hope I have, that polygamy is, is a bogey. There's yeah. no polygamy. It is not possible, right? Now, ask uh, 10 people uh, what is the answer. They will say uniform civil code. And if you ask them, why do you say there should be uniform civil code? They will say, how can we, uh, we allow one community to have many wives, uh, whereas uh, other communities cannot have more than one? So the, the entire uh, demand for a common civil code is based on this uh, discrimination. Ke how can you have uh, you know, two kinds of laws? Is that some kind of a jealousy? That hinke char char so I think a uniform civil code uh, proposal or demand is totally ill-informed. They are totally based on ignorance. Ask the, I give you, give you a test challenge. If you ask 10 people and, and, and at least nine, if not all 10 will say, because you know, these, can, these guys can marry four. And when you tell them, okay, actually these guys are not marrying four. They are my, uh, more Hindus are marrying four rather or marrying two wives uh, than the Muslim. So I think you have to dispel this myth. Uh, so that is, to my mind, is the, the way forward. 
So, you know, with the politics that we actually see today, now it becomes very important that there has to be removal of misconceptions across communities. Uh, that is a very important uh, factor because I think that becomes very important for us as a country uh, to really go along from economic progress to social progress and things. Uh, how do we really shed this suspicion that actually exists? And it's not a one-way street. I think it is. there is a two-way street that actually happens. Uh, it is not only that uh, Hindus are feeling uh, what I call, or oh, there's something wrong. In fact, I think Muslims also feel there is something wrong. And that is where it is. I think dialogue, dialogue, that is the, the way forward. Because uh, till I wrote my book, this propaganda had gone unchallenged. So, and it was uh, increasing by the day. So why is it that, uh, although there, actually there have been researches by scholars, but you know, sometimes, you know, scholars, uh, scholarly writing are uh, written by them and read by them. They do not become public knowledge. They did not, don't, do not become part of a public discourse. Now, I think my uh, book deserves uh, discussion. You are discussing it with me. And uh, very frankly, and uh, I would request you to be brutally frank, criticize me, attack me if I have said anything wrong. So, and so that I explain to you what I've written. And in any case, the purpose of my book, as I've spelled out in the beginning itself, is to bring the two communities together, not to, uh, you know, strengthen the Hindu versus Muslim issue, but to say that this is the absolute myth, it's not versus, it is Hindus and Muslims together. They constitute the bulk of India and they have to work together. And in fact, if you see the uh, dedication of my book, it says uh, it is dedicated to the unity and diversity, India's abiding identity. So you know, that is the purpose. And I've written in my introduction that even if one person uh, gets convinced that these myths need to be dispelled, I think I've succeeded. I would like to bring the two communities together Instead of, uh, now you had mentioned another thing, uh, it's, I think in some context, why, why talk of Muslims separately or Hindus separately. Then uh, I would uh, say that talking of a uh, different segment is uh, from the point of view of communication is important. I'm a social marketing PhD and social marketing tells us that people are no target audience. Now the, there are segments of target audiences and they have to be dealt with separately. Now, Hindus and Muslims are in a way are separate audiences because suppose you are a family planning worker and you come to me, Qureshi, you have too many children, uh, you should do family planning. And I answer that, uh, you know, my religion is against family planning. Since you have no answer, you know nothing about it, you will just hang your head and go away. Now, we have to equip our workers to, uh, to argue, no, that is wrong. Islam is not against family planning. Here is a booklet. Here is what it says. In fact, I volunteer that I'll develop and create a resource book for trainers and for the staff so that they understand and they can answer. Now, I had also mentioned that I, when I was writing this original paper, not a book, in 95, I wrote to the Joint Secretary Concern of Ministry of Family Welfare at that time that what communication efforts have you made for the Muslims? She wrote an answer that, you know, we make no distinction between Hindus and Muslims. We have very general communication. Now, what may be politically correct answer is a very silly answer from the point of view of communication. Now, Hindus will not say that my religion is against uh, family planning. And Muslims will say, therefore, this communication has to be addressed to the Muslim. For since Muslims are the resistant group, as every single paper, every single document and policy has emphasized in the last 70 years that Muslims uh, are the resistant group. Uh, true, they are. But what is the solution? What are you doing with their resistance? So since they, this is a resistant group, you have to deal with them. You have to answer mm -hmm. them. You have to explain to them the religion. So, and when I say, you know, segmentation, men and women, rural, urban, literate, illiterate, they all, they're all different. Uh, for illiterate audience, if we, I make a lovely book and a lovely poster, which you cannot read, that will be silly. So, you know, we have to see the audience uh, uh, segmented into uh, different groups and address their needs. It has to be their communication need in the language uh, they understand through the media they are familiar with. 
So, which is, and in fact, I have given a complete strategy, gratis, pro bono, I have written for the government of India, which is why actually UNFP had come to me to uh, write a strategy paper for which gave, they were giving me a lot of money, one and a half lakhs for one month. My salary was just 5,000. It was attractive. But I said, I will do it. Although uh, first I tried to wriggle out of it, saying that I'm not an Islamic scholar, which I was not, I'm still not, and never have, uh, I've never worked in family planning. But they got after me. And uh, then I said, all right, if you insist that I'll do it free. So, uh, they still haggle, we haggle, we settled on one rupee. Even that we have not collected. You know, we, uh, yeah. But the, the, the fact is that uh, I've given a complete strategy how to uh, make Muslims understand. Because I realized that many of them, I did a, a little bit of original primary study also in three uh, cities of India, Hyderabad, Lucknow, and Alwar. So to find firsthand what do the Muslims feel, about 70% and, uh, <laughs> said that Islam is against family plan. Mm -hmm. So we asked them, who told you that? They said, yeah, our Maulana. So we went to the Maulana and said, Saab, batayye, sa, is Islam against family plan? Haji. Who told you that? We have heard from our children. So, you know, it was very vague kind of a feeling. But in any case, the, the, here is an identified task. If uh, this is the ignorance, we have to address it. And how do we address it? By talking to the Maulana, which is why I have said, you know, the, uh, there is a chapter on Muslim countries, their success story. Iran, you had mentioned earlier, has the best family planning in the entire, uh, not only the Muslim world, but uh, in, the, in the world. 80% of people have uh, adopted family planning. They are very conservative. So let us get the scholars from uh, Iran. Indonesia has used mosques, the Friday khutbah, for pr propagating family planning. Let us get imams from Indonesia, from Bangladesh, and talk to our imams. And so this is an uh, exchange of uh, ideas. And we can uh, similarly send our uh, uh, ulama and our uh, media persons to these countries to learn how come those Muslim countries, be, despite being Muslim, they are doing family planning as a state policy and so proactively with the support of the clerics. So if they can do it, why can't we? Now imagine Bangladesh has overtaken. They were part of Pakistan. Pakistan has been left behind by Bangladesh by mile. They have left us behind. Their uh, fertility rate is lower than India and they're all Muslim, mostly Muslim. Hey, so, you know, the, we need action. Very nice. And you know, like you make a very important point, and I, I somehow fully agree with you that we have to go beyond political and emotional arguments and go to these empirical arguments of numbers and everything, uh, and do a scientific approach for communication as to how it has to be done. We uh, very fully agree with. You. And but then moving beyond this, I think, you know, like we are also seeing some demo, uh, democratic changes in India. Like uh, our democracy is changing in a very significant way. Uh, and I have to ask you a question because you've been the chief election commissioner, so I can't really let you go without asking you one or two questions on this. There, there's this huge debate uh, that is actually happening uh, within the country at this point in time, and that is about the compromise of the election commission. Uh, would you agree with that point? Uh, well, uh, compromise is maybe a strong word, but uh, I do feel sad and upset that the election commission is being called into question so regularly. You know, any attack on the election commission hurts me personally because they, uh, this is one institution which even I have nurtured. A few bricks have been laid by me also. So uh, every citizen will be upset when the institutions break down and uh, a person who has been part of that institution will be uh, affected doubly. So I feel uh, sad that the you know, as a matter of uh, state policy, a state action, these institutions are being uh, uh, compromised and uh, if not being demolished. And uh, I, well, I hope it is a temporary phenomenon and uh, things will bounce back. There have, there have been some aberrations even in the past, but not of this magnitude. You know, I uh, have given a lecture from Harvard to Oxford to the... Uh, London and uh, Geneva. So there used to be one slide which was, uh, carried a collage of newspaper headlines after 2009 uh, election. 
well done election congratulation election commission the election commission is the hero election commission is the winner now what are the headlines these days terrible now uh, my lecture has been preempted by, by because they, from somebody from the audience throws the the current headlines at me and on what moral right will i have to be defending an institution which is not bothered about itself so this the reputation uh, of the institution uh, has to be guarded by the incumbent themselves and the fact that internally one election commissioner protested and he was hounded out uh, uh, says it all it is therefore it is not our imagination that something is wrong the fact that somebody revolted within the commission and he was hounded so is a proof enough so mm -hmm. i feel that the uh, ultimately a institution is as good or as bad as the incumbent and uh, this is something i've been saying in any case you know if you have some work in uh, say home ministry and you are the under secretary you're dealing with is a good guy the home ministry is uh, very good for you the government of india is good and if he is a bad guy so the, for you the government is bad the home puri uh, ministry is bad right so therefore ultimately it uh, is on the incumbent now the the incumbent who was hounded out was a uh, pointy of the same government by the way so but uh, with a different kind of uh, thinking and with a different conscience so i would appeal to the conscience of my three colleagues uh, that uh, they should uphold the tradition uh, which is expected and they should uh, not bother about uh, uh, post retirement uh, posting and because uh, how much higher can you go so i think uh, it's time to be stand up the uh, time to stand up and be counted uh, that is what they need to remember mm -hmm. and one last two questions uh, from you before we close the conversation uh, there are many challenges that indian democracy faces as a lot of people have said uh, we could agree on some we could disagree on some but one of them is of course this uh, dominant disharmony to say it to a certain extent we need to really bring the communities together what do you think would be the other sets of challenges uh, that we are facing right now uh, sorry i couldn't get your question my you know uh, my mind is straight to into something else and so, uh, and what i was saying is like what are the challenges that indian democracy faces today beyond in the communal uh, discord that exists or that is yeah, yeah. pointed uh, beyond you know one of course is the, the the strength in the ring the of the electoral process or then of the election commission as i said that uh, we would expect that the three election committee to go uh, by their conscience and stand up uh, against uh, uh, instructions which are not uh, um, fit to uh, be complied with so now we, this is uh, all based on hope but hope can never be a strategy we have to have institutional system uh, mechanism uh, to make sure that the election commissions are independent to ho ho hoping that they will be independent in future uh, is neither here nor there we what are the institutional checks we can have and for which i have been uh, su suggesting uh, right from the day uh, the time when i was cc myself and my predecessors have said the same thing that our appointment should be done by a collegium the most powerful election commission in the world has the most defective system of appointment we are appointed by the government of the day without uh, consulting the opposition and we have, although we are familiar with the system of collegium our judges are appointed through collegium cic cvc they are appointed through collegium even director of cbi who is not even a constitutional body or statutory body is just a government department like the director of agriculture but realizing the importance of this post the supreme court had put its foot down and they said they should be appointed through a collegium why not the most important political institution the election commission so election commissioners should be appointed by collegium consisting of a leader of opposition and chief justice beside the prime minister and after that the elevation of the uh, to election commissioner to cc should be by seniority automatically by seniority so that they do not feel they are on probation 
Otherwise, what happens is that the two commissioners will uh, be looking over their shoulder. Is the government happy with me? Will they uh, promote me? Will they elevate me? Now, this weak in the institution. This needs to uh, uh, be handled. And it's very easy. Uh, start a collegium from tomorrow. Uh, 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 and secondly, the removal of the two election commissioners is not protected by the constitution. Now, when constitution uh, gave protection to CEC that he can only be removed through impeachment, it used to be a one-member commission. That protection was not for an individual, it was for the institution. It happened that he was a single-man institution. Now, it's a three-member institution. The same protection automatically should be extended to all three. So, what is the government uh, waiting for? So, they, you know, the government come and go and it is 20 years and we have been crying ourselves hoarse, but this reform is just not happening. No, somebody has to, to uh, call the government uh, to question. We have been doing it, then uh, there has to be a public uh, cry. Let, uh, let the court decide the matter has gone to Supreme Court. So, hope uh, Supreme Court will rise to the challenge because Supreme Court also has not uh, colored itself with glory in the last four or five years, unfortunately. Again, as I said, it uh, depends on uh, incumbent. Supreme Court is that particular individual for a particular judge, chief justice at that time. Uh, the, another one comes who is good, who is better, then the, the quality of judgment improves. So, I have said in my book, uh, an, an Undocumented Wonder, The Making of the Great Indian Election, that judiciary, have judiciary, Supreme Court is the, our guardian angel. Lots of reforms have come through the Supreme Court. And when you say what are the possible reforms, that criminalization of politics, the use of money power in politics. So these are two other reforms which uh, we need to address uh, very, very urgently. Mm -hmm. So very interesting. And then, but just a one, one minute answer possibility. Like, what do you think is the future of India and Indian democracy? Well, uh, India is a great country, they are the largest democracy, and hopefully, uh, if we all work together, it, uh, we would, should try and strive to make it the greatest democracy. And the future is bright. Uh, they, there are hiccups uh, now and then, you know, there are setbacks. So, but uh, there is resilience. And, uh, and what is happening to democracy in India? India is not alone, mind you. Uh, since I am a member of International Idea, Every year we publish a global document, a global index of democracy. We find that the, the democracy is on the retreat in majority of, of the world. And that's a global problem. And at the same time, we found that there is a resilience in democracy. It bounces back. And in many countries, it has bounced back. And hopefully in India also, it will. And uh, very soon, inshallah. Very nice. And but one last thing, what more do you think you would like to tell your audience to read? Like say, three of your favorite books. We always ask that question, like that you would suggest that people should read. Beyond no, your I... population myth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, right, right now I've been, uh, I'm still uh, reading uh, Ghazala Wahab book on the, the Born a Muslim because uh, we have appeared in uh, Jaipur Literary Festival and uh, many other uh, discussions together on the same book. So I, therefore I thought, I must read her book. I am uh, also, I went through Kabir Bedi's book. He is uh, my dear friend from college, Kabir Bedi, the uh, stories I must uh, tell. Beautifully written, uh, very captivating book. So that's one. Then there is another book which I've been reading is uh, Dateline Dehradun. So that's uh, very interesting because Dehradun is a cultural center and educational center. So I uh, have a whole lot of books. Uh, in fact, for the first time in my life, I find that I'm liberally ordering books on Amazon. Otherwise, I always waited for a book to be presented to me by the author. <laughs> so, and uh, but I find the investment in, in the book is a good idea. Only uh, my only problem is I'm a very slow reader. So yeah, if I start, it takes me a week, ten days to finish a book. So many times it happens that after twenty pages, thirty pages. I move to the next. So there are, must be uh, at least 50 books uh, in my shelves, which are only 20, 30 pages read uh, because I move on. Uh, 
Uh, there is a, uh, I remember in the academy in our days, there used to be a rapid reading course, but that was for those who were repeating and uh, so we had no time. But rapid reading course is some course I would like to undergo so that I... Uh, <laughs> So uh, maybe you, you should do something like a rapid X uh, English course or whatever. Something like what Kapil Dev used to actually <laughs> say at some so, point. Well, my, my English is not so bad as Kapil. <laughs> but <laughs> I need that. <laughs> Great, sir. Like this has just been such a fascinating interaction and such an eye-opening interaction. I think I would really request everybody in the country to read this book, The Population Myth, because I think it dispels a lot of myths. And I think uh, this this could be, in fact, as uh, Dr. Qureshi said, uh, if even 1% of India changes because of this book, uh, it would just become a better place. We'll become a better country. We'll become a much more loving country uh, as we really look at it. Dr. Qureshi, it has been an honor to have you with us. Thanks a lot for accepting my request. Thank you, Amit, for inviting me and for such an uh, enlightening uh, discussion. Uh, provocative, but at the same time, he tried to... Uh, bring out the, the best in me. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So kind of you. I, I look forward to being in touch with you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Same here. Bye-bye. Sure.